Few films have played as substantial a role in my life as Spider-Man 2 has. It's hard to know where to begin when talking about a film that holds such a profound personal importance. I recall that Spider-Man 2 was the third film that I'd ever seen in the cinema, the first being Toy Story 2 and the second being Shrek 2. When Spider-Man 2 was coming out, I was pretty cautious about it. Yes, as an eight-year-old kid, I was cautious about an upcoming Spider-Man film. Some things never change, the reasons do though. See, as a kid, I wouldn't get to see Spider-Man 1 in the movie theater. It was a 12 here in the UK. I had to wait until the VHS release, and I remember pretty vividly that I was more excited by the toys that accompanied that release than the film itself. Why? Because as a six-year-old, I wasn't really interested in Peter Parker or his world. I just wanted to see Spider-Man performing stunts and beating up bad guys. The film did deliver on that front, but I was still at that age where a two-hour movie feels like an entire day. So given that you don't really see Spider-Man until a little before the halfway mark, it felt like a long time to wait to see Spider-Man in a movie called Spider-Man at that age. You guys know how I feel about that movie now. As a kid, I was mesmerized by the Spider-Man action, which remains exciting today as it was back then. But as an adult, what really separates the Sam Raimi Spider-Man films from other comic book movies is their investment in the character of Peter Parker and the willingness to explore the flaws and pitfalls that come with this man's double life. Spider-Man 1 is truly something special, even if my younger self couldn't quite recognize that. But then the question is, how did 8-year-old me feel about Spider-Man 2? Well, I recall running out of the cinema after the film had ended, making little imaginary web flips, declaring it the best movie ever, and begging my parents to take me to Burger King so I could get a kid's meal with a Spider-Man toy. The toy was this plastic web shooter with a paper tube that would extend with webs printed on it, giving off the illusion of a web shooter. I played with this toy something fierce though, thought it was truly special because unlike those silly string web shooters that you could pay money for, this one would never run out. Kid me though, it, it's paper mate, calm down. But I think that this is just a testament to how much this film captured my imagination at this age. In terms of my opinion of this film, since I was eight years old and I first saw it, my opinion hasn't actually changed that much, but the reasons for it have. See, back then, the extent of my praise was basically, it has lots of Spider-Man in it, which is, I guess, not untrue. Yeah, this one is the Spider-Man No More movie, but there's no shortage of Spider-Man swinging about, falling down alleys, getting his ass beat up by Doc Ock, delivering pizzas, stealing that guy's pizza, stopping car robberies. The Spider-Man angle is just more present this time around, so naturally, Kid Me felt more sated as far as stunts and costumes go. But at this stage, I want to move on from 8-year-old me now. Let's move over to 26-year-old me, because a kid is rarely a great source for insightful commentary. I don't know, I'm, I'm really just here though to talk and gush generally. Hello there, I'm Captain America, and I'm here to give you a PSA. Now, if you love your country, you'll want to subscribe to Channel Pup. If you don't love your country, well that's just too bad. But you can still subscribe anyway. Kami's welcome. And of course, well, actually, uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, but of course, nothing comes free in this country, except for freedom. And no exception is the Adobe subscriptions that Channel Pub needs to make these videos. So be sure to check out the patron link in the description below. And God bless America. A point you'll see flying around quite a bit on social media is that Spider-Man 2 is overrated. And much of the praise for this film is determined by the nostalgia of those who grew up watching it. Now, on one hand, yes, Spider-Man 2 is a reminder of one of the happiest periods of my life. But that's only because this movie inspired that happiness in the first place. So, like, I guess I can understand the angle of, like, yeah, this film does remind people of happy times, but generally, I couldn't disagree with this point more. I mean, I'm gonna jump in my own principles real quick, which I don't expect everyone to share, but this whole thing just reeks of the dismissal of positive points rather than providing even a basic thesis as to why Spider-Man 2 might not be that good. I'm not saying you're wrong to dislike Spider-Man 2, as tricky as it is to avoid that line of thinking, 
But to chalk all positivity up to nostalgia is just such a nothing and unproductive point. Also, I do tend to avoid words like overrated because it feels like it's just kind of acting as though my opinion of a film matters more than the people that like it more than I do. It's overrated, says who? Is the person that thinks I'm overrating this film an objective measure for its actual quality? But with all that being said, what is so damn special about Spider-Man 2? What makes it stand above other superhero films in the eyes of its fans? Well, I don't think I've ever seen a superhero movie dive into the humanity of its protagonist and with such intricate world building as Spider-Man 2. I mean look, take a film like Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, a film that is very disinterested in its characters and possible themes in favour of woo, spectacle and sci-fi. Spider-Man 2 is the absolute antithesis to that. But how? Well, Spider-Man 1 established with its ending that Peter's vow to Spider-Man, his vow to responsibility, means that he needs to maintain some distance between himself and those he loves. Consequently, Spider-Man 2 explores the toll that this takes on Peter, as his life as Spider-Man becomes destructive to his life as Peter Parker. We've established that there needs to be some distance between Peter and MJ. We are now exploring how difficult this is for Peter, even more difficult with Mary Jane becoming engaged to John Jameson. Tension is growing between Peter and his best friend Harry Osborn over the death of Harry's father, Norman. Peter finally reveals the truth about his role in the death of Uncle Ben to Aunt May, but cannot reveal to her what he'd go on to do and how he would take responsibility for it, creating tensions between the two. He can't pay his rent, he can't hold down a job, and what's so great about all of this is that nothing is glossed over. We actually spend a little time with Peter and his landlord, Mr. Ditkovich. We learn who he is and what he's about, who his family are. Yes, it is easy to dismiss him as a comic relief side character, but he's here for a reason. The first scene of this movie has Spider-Man delivering pizzas while also saving some jaywalking kids, only to arrive at the customers mere minutes late and be fired because of it, and Joe's Pizza's dumb delivery time guarantee refund policy in this universe. Which is obviously gonna put the staff on the firing line. Don't make promises you can't keep, Mr. Aziz. Because they're not gonna be the best kind for another eight years yet. The point I'm making is we don't just hear of Peter getting fired. We don't just hear of him being late on the rent. We see it. We experience it and it brings us more quotable characters like Mr. Aziz and Mr. Ditkovich. So I mentioned before, Mary Jane is engaged to John Jameson, which all could have happened off screen. But that's just not how Spider-Man 2 approaches its world building. John Jameson's screen time probably amounts to around about a minute, but in that very brief time they managed to build an interesting parallel between Spider-Man and John Jameson. John Jameson is the astronaut son of J. Jonah Jameson. He's kind of viewed and treated as the all-American hero, but unlike Spider-Man, there's no double life going on, meaning that he can become engaged to Mary Jane. He can have a personal life. He gets the recognition that comes with being a hero, and of course, there's this juxtaposition between J. Jonah Jameson's attitude towards Spider-Man, pushing him as this menace to the city, and then his son, John Jameson, who he brags about constantly. Peter is an American hero in his own right, but when he becomes absent in the lives of others, nobody can understand why. When it comes to Harry Osborn, he believes that Spider-Man murdered his father Norman, and Peter is honoring Norman's wishes that he not tell Harry that he was the Green Goblin. This really speaks to the strength of Peter's character. The Green Goblin was his enemy, he tormented him, and yet Peter is keeping all of that a secret to protect his loved ones. So while Peter, someone who has done all he can to be a friend to Harry, aside from smooching his girlfriend in the first movie, is taking the brunt of Harry's grief and apathy over the death of his father Norman, who was generally not a good father to Harry. It's intensified by the fact that Harry is aware of Peter's affiliations with Spider-Man, given that he takes his picture for the Daily Bugle. 
Peter is protecting the image of Norman Osborn all at the expense of his own life. Spider-Man 2 does an incredible job of taking a regular mundane life where Peter holds down a basic job, has a relationship and his friends all like him, and turns it into a fantasy for this character. While swinging above tall buildings and fighting villains is the crushing reality that he has to live with. It's a total inverse of what you'd typically expect life as a superhero to feel like. Being Spider-Man is not escapism for Peter. Walking down the street and eating a hot dog is. What's more is that Peter's spider powers are now starting to fade as well. You'd sincerely wonder what's the point of being Spider-Man at this stage. Well, aside from keeping eight-year-old me's attention, I guess. Now, there's a lot of clever stuff here, even if we just completely boil it down to the comic nerdy stuff. In these films, Spider-Man's webs are fully organic. They just shoot straight out of his wrists. So you're not necessarily going to see him in the midst of a high-stakes action sequence running out of webs, right? Well, nope, that's not the case. We've got a way around it. We've got a story here where Peter's powers are starting to fade with his motivation to continue on as Spider-Man. It's his mind's influence over his powers, and his powers way of telling him it's time to stop. And so he does after a meeting with a psychologist where he chalks up his tenure as Spider-Man to just dreams to avoid revealing his secret identity. I think the psychologist knows though. Once again, we don't just hear of Peter making the decision to let Spider-Man go. We have a dream sequence of him rejecting Uncle Ben's wishes, which any normal person would still think he took a little too literally, but hey, I'm not Uncle Ben, what do I know? And so the die is cast. Spider-Man is no more. The life of Peter Parker resumes as it were, but things aren't quite as they seem. Even though Peter is more present in the lives of his loved ones, there is such a thing as too late. Peter's attempts at restoking the flame between him and MJ are rendered null and void. The damage done to his life is done. After revealing the truth about Uncle Ben's death to Aunt May, Peter is now at his absolute lowest point, questioning if he's ever meant to have anything he wants. Now, remember I mentioned earlier that Mr. Dikovich's family they actually play a role in this film. Dickovich's daughter Ursula breaks the downward spiral, offering Peter Parker something so simple as a slice of chocolate cakey relief. And from here, things do start to sort themselves out. Aunt May comes to terms with what happened with Uncle Ben and inspires Peter to get up one last time in the same way that Uncle Ben did, all while being pretty ambiguous as to whether or not she knows that he was Spider-Man. And MJ starts to reconsider her feelings towards Peter. Heck, even J. Jonah Jameson starts to reconsider his stance on Spider-Man, but what forces him back into the red and blue is Doc Ock. Wow, it is insane that I've gotten to 12 minutes and 25 seconds into this video without even mentioning Doc Ock. So Peter starts pursuing the work of Otto Octavius in a bid to improve his grades, and Dr. Connors arranges an appointment with Octavius for Peter to get to know him. Octavius is pursuing his dream of free renewable energy by creating a miniature artificial sun that he operates with a set of mechanical arms operated by his brain, which is protected by an inhibitor chip. The experiment goes south, Octavius is humiliated, his wife killed in the disaster, and the inhibitor chip is destroyed, giving Ox tentacles complete control over his mind. Octavius is now hell-bent on retrying the experiment at any cost, holding anything and anyone to ransom as collateral, including Mary Jane. With his life both as Spider-Man and Peter Parker now hanging in the balance, Spider-Man returns to defeat Doc Ock and put a stop to his artificial sun experiment. Both Spider-Man and Doc Ock are dreamers. Peter yearns for a happy life, a hilltop wedding with Mary Jane Watson. Otto is a man crushed by the weight of his ambition. He originally set out to create his artificial son to benefit mankind. Now he's willing to recreate that experiment, and the fate of the entire city is an acceptable sacrifice. He is now controlled by his own invention being his mechanical arms. 
In the end, Doc Ock finally accepts that he's become crushed by the weight of his dreams and takes responsibility. He takes his last moment of clarity as a chance to not die a monster and brings the artificial sun into the river with him where he drowns. Peter's identity is revealed to Mary Jane, the barrier between the two is finally broken. Mary Jane finally understands the distance the two of them had. All is forgiven. But Peter still chooses responsibility. He sends Mary Jane back into the loving arms of fiancé John Jameson. But on the day of her wedding, Mary Jane chooses Peter. She abandons John Jameson at the altar and runs to Peter instead, making her own choice to be with him. And Spider-Man swings off into the sunset as Mary Jane watches on with a look of concern and dread on her face, which closes out the film. At its core, the theme of Spider-Man 2 is dreams, and the choices that we make according to them. Peter dreams of being with Mary Jane Watson, but continually denies himself that dream in the name of acting responsibly, keeping her out of danger, honoring the wishes of Uncle Ben. A lot of this is communicated through dreamlike imagery and language. Peter tells Mary Jane he envisioned her getting married on a hilltop, Peter finally rejects Uncle Ben's wishes in a dream sequence. Octavius dreams of creating a completely sustainable energy source, using his scientific gift to benefit mankind. When his dream is initially denied, he stops at nothing to realize it, no matter the cost. When it comes to Peter, his life is destructive to his dreams. But when it comes to Otto, his dreams are destructive to his life making the two of them like a yin and yang. It's also helped by the fact that a spider has eight legs and an octopus has eight tentacles. We've also got Harry Osborn who dreams of living up to his father's legacy. He funds Otto Octavius' failed experiment. He hallucinates his father demanding he be avenged, which ultimately leads him into the lair of the Green Goblin, revealing the truth about his father. Up until this point, Harry has spent his time deluded into thinking that Norman Osborn was innocent. And the reveal of the Green Goblin lair is like an awakening. Aunt May holds an integral role in this film. It's her who delivers the line that defines this film, the themes, and Peter's arc in the same way that Uncle Ben did in Spider-Man 1. An evolution of the with great power comes great responsibility mantra, and one that is in every way as profound and haunting as the with great power comes great responsibility mantra. Sometimes, to do what's right, we have to be steady and give up the thing we want the most, even our dreams. A haunting line of dialogue that defines this story. Little bit of trivia here, the word dream or dreams comes up 15 times in the script for Spider-Man 2. While Spider-Man 1 was by no means thematically bankrupt, in fact, I still consider it to be one of the most important movies of all time, Spider-Man 2 has quite a bit more on its mind. It's suitably more mature than its predecessor. The goofy, hokey, comic booky dialogue is for the most part absent this time around. Spider-Man 2 is a sadder, more mature film with a much broader sense of scope. The cinematography this time around is much cleaner, with less production goofs such as cameras and tripods in shot like Spider-Man 1 had. It's also a little less colourful this time around, but there's a lot more confidence in the camera angles and movements. Sadly, all copies of the film available for home release are in a tightly letterboxed aspect ratio, which in my opinion feels a bit too tight and claustrophobic considering the vast personal scope of this film and how it explores this landscape of lives in New York City. It doesn't feel like it was filmed for Letterbox. There are a lot of close-up shots of faces and expressions, and it feels like we're only getting a slither of that in our Letterboxd aspect ratio compared to what I feel we should have gotten. This is a quote that will be taken out of context for years to come, but... It just feels too tight. My preferred way to watch this one is using the 35mm open mat. You get the whole image and it looks gorgeous. Plus, unlike the Spider-Man 1 35mm open mat, everything here is designed to fit within the 4-3 aspect ratio. I much prefer to get the whole image rather than just the fraction of it we get in the home releases. If Sony announce a home release of the 4x3 35mm open mat version of this film, believe me, I would buy it day one. 
Sam Raimi's directing has also stepped up a notch too. Action sequences are kept continuously fresh by Raimi enveloping the codes and conventions of other various genres into his action sequences, as they rapidly move from high stakes tension to slapstick to drama to horror. We'll cut from shots of Spider-Man and Doc Ock in action to shots of the crowd and civilians who are all doing something, as opposed to just standing there reacting. Every background extra feels like a character in their own tiny vignette, and they never feel passive. Spider-Man 2 is also home to some of the most rhythmic and exhilarating action sequences I've ever seen in any movie, as the action makes use of every possible element of the environment and characters. But to stop these from feeling like purely elaborate dances, we also get plenty of moments with Spider-Man and Ock just throwing punches at each other, beating each other into submission which is the difference between pure spectacle and character drama. Also, the scene with Doc Ock in the hospital having his tentacles removed? An incredible piece of horror film directing, and it's no surprise that this comes from horror veteran Sam Raimi, whose signature is just all over this film. Danny Elfman has also stepped up on the soundtrack. It's much more of an emotional score this time, befitting of a more mature and emotional film. The use of leitmotifs for both Spider-Man and Octavius it's as strong as it was in the first Spider-Man film score. But there are also some excellent callbacks, particularly in the fire scene, which uses the same musical cues as the fire from the first film. Now, writing-wise, there's a few other things that I do want to talk about with this movie, particularly the characters of Peter and Mary Jane. A common criticism of Spider-Man 2 is that Mary Jane becomes incredibly unlikable over the course of the film. This is not helped by the fact that there are some things that she did in Spider-Man 1 which, when you think about, are pretty unlikable. The unlikable reputation of Mary Jane Watson is something I do want to explore, because in some ways I do agree, in others not so much. For one, I think it's deliberate that Mary Jane is an incredibly flawed character between Spider-Man 1 and 2. In Spider-Man 1, yes, she cheats on Harry Osborn with Spider-Man while the two were officially dating. Now I will say this, while they were officially dating, labels on it, I don't believe that Mary Jane and Harry were at all serious. There was never an on-screen kiss, the two did not have any chemistry whatsoever, and the two characters are portrayed as very young. Moving into Spider-Man 2, Mary Jane was accused of using John Jameson as leverage against Peter, but I don't think that is really true. I think more than anything else, she wanted to move on and tried to force herself to by getting engaged to John Jameson. Where my sympathy for Mary Jane starts to dwindle, though, is when she tries to kiss Peter at the cafe while in a relationship with John. Scratch that while engaged to John, it's even up a notch. With that being said, I think her intentions would have been entirely to break up with John had Peter reciprocated, which wouldn't be as bad as outright staying with him after kissing another man. But where my sympathy kinda just runs out and I feel she goes too far is abandoning him at the altar. If you've ever known someone who has been abandoned at the altar, you'll probably be aware that it's a pretty traumatizing experience and a horrible thing to inflict on anyone. It's not helped by the fact that John Jameson is a perfectly likable guy. At the same time, it is easy to kind of say that she should have broken things off earlier when she realized that she still had feelings for Peter after the cafe sequence, but in fairness, she got kidnapped and then the very next day, presumably, she's getting married. She didn't actually have a lot of chances to put the kibosh on things, and finding out that Peter was Spider-Man would have been something of a game changer. What was she actually supposed to do here? Well, I mean... She could marry him and then get a divorce later, but then that's a whole can of worms. Sometimes you gotta do these things as soon as you can. Best thing, call him in the morning and call off the wedding. I mean, that's also gonna hurt him, but like, surely it's not as bad as getting left at the altar, because then you don't have to deal with the outright humiliation. I don't know, it was a very complex case. Now, with all that being said, it is worth exploring the flaws of Peter Parker as well. See, in Spider-Man 1, he had a little crush, viewing MJ as the girl next door, and the two did have a clear connection. In Spider-Man 2, Peter's view of Mary Jane Watson is actually pretty unhealthy. She is his dream, and he treats her as such, asserting to her how he imagined her getting married on a hilltop, expecting her to drop everything to be with him when he gives up being Spider-Man. Peter is in love with the idea of a life with Mary Jane. He's in love with his dream first and foremost. 
At the end of the film, Peter gets what he wants. His dream comes true. Mary Jane stands at his doorway and confesses her love. But as the relationship is consummated by a kiss, Peter swings off into the sunset. And there's a look of dread on Mary Jane's face because there's a distinct difference between dream and reality. I don't think this whole thing is executed perfectly. Again, Mary Jane was a flawed character before with indecision being her ultimate weakness, but abandoning a dude at the altar was just outright cold, whatever the reason. I think this is what cemented her as a straight up irredeemable character in the eyes of a lot of people. But I do think we do need to acknowledge that while I don't think total unlikability was the intention, I don't think they wanted us to see this as exactly a good thing either. We're happy for Peter in this moment, but I think there is a reason why the final shot of the film is Mary Jane filled with dread. And I think for as much as we acknowledge the flaws of Mary Jane Watson as a character, it's a little unhealthy how we barely talk about how Peter kind of objectifies Mary Jane. And I think what I like about this film is that it doesn't vilify any of that either. And I think this is where this film showcases such an excellent understanding of the humanity that comes with these characters and their actions. It's why even though Peter Parker's dream is a very flawed one, you still want to root for him and you still feel happy when he gets what he wants. There's still a sense of emotional catharsis even though we know that him and Mary Jane are not mature enough for each other. Now I do quickly want to talk about the extended cut of this film, Spider-Man 2.1. In the lead up to Spider-Man 3, Sony wanted to re-release Spider-Man 2 with some additional footage, asking Sam Raimi if he wanted to release a director's cut. Sam Raimi was fine with the idea of releasing an alternative cut, but didn't want to call it a director's cut, as he felt the cinematic release was everything he wanted it to be. He still considers the theatrical version to be the definitive version of the film, and I have to say, I completely agree with Raimi. And so Spider-Man 2.1 was born. Spider-Man 2.1 is an excellent film, in the same way that Spider-Man 2 is an excellent film. It is, by and large, the same movie. Everything I love about this film is still here, aside from Mr. Aziz's delivery of the GOOOOOOOL. Let's say the theatrical cut of Spider-Man 2 never released and this released in its place. Well, I think the film would still be as popular today as it was then. So we've got some extended scenes such as Peter's birthday, some additional shots in two of the Doc Ock fights, an extended elevator conversation, and a conversation between Mary Jane and a friend as she talks about her indecision when it comes to John Jameson. There's an extra eight minutes here, and unfortunately none of it really adds anything, aside from making the film just a bit longer. And I don't even mean that in a bad way, this is such a nothing extension. I feel like scenes like the conversation between MJ and her friend are kind of good as it gives us a bit more insight as to her character and where she's at, but the elevator scene goes on far too long now, and the performance of the elevator guy has lost all of its subtlety falling into feeling a bit more like a parody. The original elevator scene works so well because of the awkward pauses between the interactions. The 2.1 version on the other hand is just non-stop quick-fire marketing jokes. Then there are the additional shots in the Doc Ock action sequences. We've got a bit more of Spider-Man punching Doc Ock in the face during the bank fight, which doesn't really add anything but more questions to ask about why Doc Ock's face doesn't look like a meatball after those punches. And then we've got the shot where Spider-Man actually gets hit by a train during the train fight and immediately gets back up, alleviating any stakes as far as Spider-Man's mortality is concerned. To me, the theatrical cut is definitely the stronger version of the film. Spider-Man 2. It's a film that fires off on all cylinders with his action set pieces and delivers all of the spectacle you would hope for from a Spider-Man movie and then some. But what separates it from other superhero films is the heightened interest in the humanity of its characters and the theme of dreams. Spider-Man 2 is mature, surreal, sad, silly, triumphant, fun, exhilarating, perfectly paced, tenacious, confident, and such a downright masterpiece that the reasons it resonates with fans in the way that it does after two decades are pretty damn obvious just looking at this film as a body of work. 
everything is done to such a high quality, such a high standard. Sam Raimi's directing is as good as it gets. The writing is as good as it gets. The performances are as good as you could get. The action, the choreography, the cinematography, the music are all as good as you could possibly ask for. So no, it's not nostalgia. You don't need to grow up with Spider-Man 2 to see just how much great quality stuff there is in this film. You just need to engage with it. I'm not saying that you have to like Spider-Man 2, but it is a film that absolutely commands respect. Now before we go, I just, I want to treat you guys to a special surprise. So thanks to the help, support, and friendship of Suris from Suris the Skeptic and Nick from Game Apologist, I was able to go on a road trip of the East Coast USA. And one of the stops along the way was New York City. It's been my dream to go to New York City since I first saw Spider-Man 2, all those years ago. And while this trip was nothing more than a stop on a longer road trip, it was a dream come true. I recall walking around as the Flat Iron Building just sneaks up on you. The Flat Iron Building was, of course, the exterior of the Daily Bugle in the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy. This would be where J. Jonah Jameson would fire and unfire Peter Parker repeatedly after his crap photos. Turn around and you are snuck up upon by the Empire State Building. This absolute Goliath would be the building Spider-Man would swing off of in the very last shot of Spider-Man 1, and often serves as an attraction for Spider-Man fans to climb up in the Spider-Man video games. This building is so high that the searchlights atop it cast a shadow of the building into the clouds. We also saw the Chrysler building. It was here where the human spider reflected upon the death of Uncle Ben. Close by to that is Grand Central Station, where Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man would throw down with the scorpion in the Spider-Man 1 video game. We saw the Statue of Liberty from a distance, a very, very vast distance, where Spider-Man would throw down with Mysterio in Spider-Man 2 the game, but also where Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man would unite with Andrew Garfield and Tom Holland's Spider-Man to cure their oldest foes. And finally, one of the most important stops on this journey, Joe's Pizza on Carmine Street. Now in the film, if the sticker on Tobey Maguire's helmet is anything to go by, Joe's Pizza is on Bleecker Street, but the real deal is on Carmine Street. And in this pizza restaurant, they clearly celebrate their legacy as part of Spider-Man history. From images of Tobey Maguire up on the walls, and a sign saying that this place was seen in Spider-Man. Two, to be precise. The company logo is identical to the one seen in the film, and the owner of the place was even so kind as to take a selfie with us outside the building. I think he knew why we were there, but of course I did get a slice of pizza too, and I can safely say that, yeah, that nasty lady at the reception desk definitely should have paid for this. It is damn good. We also made sure to take home a couple of pizza boxes as well, because these things are basically props from the film. I am also pleased to report that they do appear to treat their staff a lot better than they did in Spider-Man 2 the movie. They must be some really good sports there. This was, like, akin to, like, a pilgrimage for me. I think every Spider-Man fan at some stage deserves to take a trip to New York, and especially a trip to Joe's Pizza. Because as someone who's grown up with Spider-Man being such an integral part of my life, actually getting to see his city, see all of these landmarks that we've seen in these movies, safe to say it was a very spiritual experience. But that is where I'm going to be leaving today's video. How do you guys feel about Spider-Man? Spider-Man 2, and how'd you feel about this video? Comment below, discuss, and as always, if you've enjoyed this video and you want to see more like it, be sure to hit subscribe, hit the like button, and now we're going to move on to the patron special thanks and shoutouts. If you want your name in the credits of these videos, as well as exclusive updates, you can get that by just pledging a dollar a month on Patreon, just like the generous folks here. And I will now shout out the patrons who are pledging $10 or more. Kale Bennett, That Jordo, Ken K, Adam Myers, Mr. Dr. SP, in brackets, Dr. Pending, Sergio, and Saurus the Skeptic. Thank you so much, you crazy poibles. And as for the rest of you, thank you so much for watching, and have a great day.